Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. The leadership of the party now um, has tolerated a, a really astounding level of corruption. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 47, the second half of my amazing interview with Rowan Moore Garrity. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. If you haven't done so, I highly recommend you go back and listen to part one, which is wonderful. This is part two of that interview. And I'll let Rowan and I take it from here. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a, a vexing problem. You know, it's, it seems like one that would be very hard to overcome, especially if the disease moves to different places. And that that um, that issue of kind of the white people showing up in trucks keeps happening. Right. You know, and maybe it's like a like a big education outreach over years would have to happen to really change people's minds about about that. You know, there's an interesting facet of that where I don't know how much education and outreach around cholera specifically would work. And and I should say it's not just the white people getting out of trucks. You know, it's um, unfortunately the, the, the violence has claimed a number of lives over the years. But, you know, people will stone, you know, throw rocks uh, and set fire to vehicles. There have been nurses, Mozambican nurses who have been buried alive. Um, health centers have been burned down. Um, so some pretty brutal stuff has happened, but um, the the real solution I think is is a sort of a common sense one, which is that you know if you want cholera not to be so devastating or have the potential to be so devastating, you need to build some sanitation infrastructure, right? Like people need mm-hmm. to have access to water um, and uh, you know facilities to use the bathroom on a basis that does not put their lives in danger, and so um, unfortunately. It may have helped somewhat, but the main response that we have seen in these areas, maybe because it's the only one that is affordable to the government and the sort of current landscape of things, has been outreach and education. But the communities where I visited after, you know, years later, after they had done these lectures at the local health center and things like that to say, no, 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 you guys misunderstood. It really is this disease. People meet that with a lot of the same mistrust and skepticism that they meet the response at the height of the emergency. And so mm. um, it may be that uh, that changes gradually over time, right? That incrementally it is making a difference, but I'm not sure that education alone will really uh, move the needle. Yeah, the onus should be more on the government is what you're saying to actually install facilities and, right. and upgrade the infrastructure. Right. Yeah. Or if you're an NGO, right, or a foreign NGO, it's hard because some people, you know, a, a, a crises are really crises, right? They do demand an outsized response. But, um, you know, it's worth asking if it would be, you know, better to try and have some kind of continuous presence um, in regions where you want to work on sanitation and health issues, right? Um, some of these NGOs just have a very limited footprint. Um, outside of the moment of these outbreaks and uh, some of that's funding, you know, but but I, I think there is some sort of hard work to do about how to conceptualize what a more kind of trustworthy approach would be mm. from the perspective of local people. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to be sure and get to, you know, the <laughs> the characters at the at the in the title of the book here, the crocodiles. So. You talk about the problem between essentially the humans and the animals, and this, like we've talked about, many problems is is something that occurs all over the world. Uh, but in this case, the encroachment happens to 
be on crocodile land. And so maybe it would be interesting to find out from you a bit more about some of the problems between humans and crocodiles in Mozambique and and maybe other animals and sort of what, what are some of the pro proposed solutions and, you know, what, what can be done really? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the basic problem, you don't see, you see it, it kind of anywhere there and like, you know, North America, we don't have any, uh, you know, 1200 pound predators left in most places. Right. Um, or, or even bigger in the case of elephants or elephants aren't predators, but you know, we don't have animals of the size that they do. Um, in parts of Mozambique and many other places in Africa. And I think that's a, an interesting kind of reality check, right? We've hunted a lot of the megafauna of the world to extinction. But um, in Mozambique, I, so I, I, the chapter, the title of the book comes from a chapter on um, human crocodile conflict along the Zambezi River, which is a really important waterway um, that has, you know, a big hydropower projects along it. It's a very important wildlife corridor. It's a hugely important water source for, a, you know, a large number of people. And um, I focused on this community way at the sort of western tip of Mozambique um, that has lost, uh, that had lost at the time that I visited um, 50 people um, over 10 years to crocodile attacks out of a total population of somewhere around 1,000, right? So, five percent of the population um in 10 years had been killed by crocodile attacks so it's a, a huge huge problem you know at the scale of that community and um the basic source of the problem is that um again people do not have access to water in a way that doesn't put their lives at risk so you don't have um running water you don't have working wells um, you don't have irrigated farmland. And so people, you know, farm on the banks of the river, they fill their buckets to wash their clothes or wash their dishes on the banks of the river. They collect water to bathe at home or even bathe at the banks of the river. And the river in this case is a place with a huge number of, uh, you know, crocodiles of a size that can eat people. Um, and, uh, the government's main response has been to send out hunters uh, once a year, essentially, up and down the Zambezi River uh, to kill a certain number of crocodiles. Um, but when you talk to even the government hunters that do that cull every year, they are pretty frank about uh, feeling that, you know, this will not get us anywhere. This isn't likely to solve the problem because we don't know that we're getting the right crocodiles, right? We could be getting smaller crocodiles than the ones that are actually capable of hunting men and women and children. Or, you know, even if we kill the right ones, this is still going to be an attractive spot for more crocodiles to swim down the river from Zambia and Zimbabwe. But the culls are really popular. Um, and they're popular for a couple reasons. Um, one is just that people, you know, I think uh, kind of by rights hate crocodiles because crocodiles are responsible for the deaths of a lot of friends and family and neighbors. Right. And so people are scared of them. And, you know, many of the people who have to sort of, you know, farm in places where elephants might trample your crops or where hippos might trample your crops or where a buffalo might come after you or where a crocodile you know, could, you know, take your child off the riverbank, you know, they just have less patience and, you know, sort of less patience or, or kind of a, you know, reverent feeling for wild animals in some instances. Um, but the, the second part of it is that there are, um, safari operators. Um, so, foreign businessmen that control big pieces of land and that invite, you know, tourists to come and go trophy hunting, right? So you might pay a few grand to kill a crocodile or a few more to kill a lion or an elephant or so forth. Um, and they haven't in all instances had very good relationships with the community. And the safari operators really want the government not to hunt crocodiles. So anyhow, the, the culls are very popular and the title comes from this thing that one of the hunters, the sort of inspectors in, in charge of the hunt said to me, which is, you know, we have to look at this basically as a political problem. And this is a political solution. It's not a technical solution. Um, if you, during an election year, go into one of these rural communities that have had to contend with, you know, serious problems with wildlife 
and you don't show up at any time of the year to hunt crocodiles, then when you ask for their vote, they'll say, ah, tell the crocodiles to vote for you. Tell the, hmm. tell the elephants to vote for you. And um, that is, I think, the kind of attitude that for me evoked succinctly, you know, how people, the sort of level of distrust and skepticism that disenfranchised people across Mozambique feel in relation to the government, in relation to sort of more powerful institutions in the country. Mm. As far as solutions, so, it's simple. Put, you know, they need running water, right? And again, it's an infrastructure problem that is being met uh, not with infrastructure, but with something else. Yeah. So, okay, we've talked about a lot of different aspects of their society and culture. Uh, do you have a sense of where Mozambique is headed? You know, is there a is there a happy ending to this? Is there a neutral ending? Is it unclear? Where do you see the country kind of going? Sure. Um, it's unclear is the short answer. Mm. Uh, and I hope that I, I haven't dissuaded anybody from visiting Mozambique. I mean, you know, journalists often take flack and sometimes rightly for focusing on problems rather than solutions and focusing on the really sort of ugly stories of life rather than the really happy ones. And, um, you know, I have a huge uh, amount of admiration and affection for many of the people I spoke to for this book. Um, the sort of just level of, you know, ingenuity and uh, determination and generosity that is required to, you know, have something like a happy life there is always um, just amazing to me. Um, in terms of where Mozambique is going, you know, it is a very resource rich country. Um, in the last few years, there's been a lot of activity around a huge, you know, tens of billions of dollars, potentially worth of natural gas um, in the northern part of the country that, you know, if that revenue is channeled into the right things, you know, could really build out uh, an education system um, for the country that would then sort of unlock other kinds of development or could build a lot of the infrastructure that the country so badly needs. It's hard to be very hopeful about the state of politics because things have been so stagnant um, just in terms of the basic balance of power. Um, Frilimo has been in power for, you know, close to 50 years at this point. And, um, the leadership of the party now um, has tolerated a, a really astounding level of corruption and an astound, you know, they, they, they have spent a lot of time kind of um, sweeping scandal under the rug and rebuffing critiques of the way they run elections and so forth. And um, people are fed up. Um, so does, you know, sort of do the inklings that we see of, um, protest and organizing and kind of outspoken politics welling up around the country, does that lead to kind of a more productive power sharing arrangement? Does that lead to, you know, the emergence of some new figure who can kind of catalyze a broader movement in Mozambique? Or does that sort of get, you know, batted down? Um, that's an open question. If Mozambique is able to pull through, it is a rich country with a huge amount of potential. And, you know, there, there has been a lot of economic growth there. There is a lot of interest from abroad. I mean, I think as an American, um, one of the things that's striking to me is how ignorant we are of our own role in the shape of things on the ground in the rest of the world. And um, we have been perfectly willing um, you know, in spite of things like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, we've been perfectly willing to basically say, yes, we will send USAID money over there. We will try to help Mozambique build its health sector, but we're not really going to worry about things as long as there are opportunities for American companies, right? And we're not really going to do a lot to constrain the ability of companies with activity in American soil, um, 
to, you know, operate freely in places that have a lot of the same difficulties that Mozambique has. So, um, you know, what does a more productive foreign policy look like or a more unified foreign policy look like for the sort of powers of the world like the U.S.? Um, it's hard to say exactly on some level, but um, you can be sure that it would be, you know, less friendly to corporate interests in the U.S., right, that it would be less friendly um, to sort of making, you know, arguments about security very narrowly understood the center of things. Um, and it would be more humble, I think, in the way that we read history. I mean, the CIA was very interested in the, you know, in, in promoting the conflict um, and other actors in the U.S. in promoting Renamo and promoting the conflict that basically ripped Mozambique apart for 15 years. And that is the hole um, that the country is trying to dig itself out of. And uh, we've never really had to reckon with that. Mm. Yeah, that's helpful. Uh, so, and I know everyone always gets this, but, you know, this this book is done. <laughs> so congrats. Uh, what do you... What are you working on now, or is there any particular area of focus that you're that you're thinking about for your next project? Um, so uh, two answers, I guess. Uh, there there are some Mozambique projects that I'd like to pursue. Uh, it's always mm -hmm. a, a bit of a heavy lift to get American editors and um, outlets to sort of focus on coverage from that part of the world. I am not living in Mozambique now, and so that makes it a harder sell, right? Because someone would have to send me there to do much reporting there. But, um, you know, there's been this uh, sort of new problem in the north of Mozambique around those natural gas fines of, uh, of um, religiously motivated violence. There seems to be the beginnings of an Islamist insurgency, which is not a problem Mozambique had a few years ago. And so I'm really interested in this question of, how the country um, sort of meets that at the early stages and how it tries to deal with that and kind of where did that come from, right? How does um, this kind of jihadi um, feeling and violence spread to a new country um, where it didn't seem like it was likely to become a problem? Um, and, you know, for the most part, I'd say I, I'm trying, at least for the time being, to spend a bit more time uh, on stories closer to home. So I'm doing a lot of reporting where I lived until June in Miami um, and trying to write a little bit more about the U.S. Um, for a variety of reasons, but uh, enjoy, enjoying that. Sounds good. Well, I'll look forward to uh, to reading all that. Uh, cool. All right. Well, let's let's do some uh, Thunder Round. Let's do a couple quick getting to know you questions and, and call it a okay. day. Okay. Sounds, Sounds good? good. All right. What is your favorite food and or drink? Oh, boy. Uh, I love a, a dark and stormy or a whiskey ginger. Mm. Um, nice. Food. Pasta, uh, you know, in all of its, in, in all of its vegetarian <laughs> yeah. flavors. Sounds about right. Uh, where is your favorite place you've ever been? And, you know, you can say Mozambique, but... If you've got uh, if you've got something else, so I uh, I thought about this a little bit. I um, yeah, out of, the year after college, I spent a, a year um, teaching elementary school in Reunion Island, which is a former French colony that's now legally a French state um, mm. that's off the coast of Madagascar, and it's this little volcanic rock. And I lived on a lychee farm there. Uh, with a creek running through it and just these beautiful steep banana fields and the forest kind of encroaching. And it's it's a place I've only been back to once since I left. But it was uh, really just, uh, an, you know, just an incredible uh, environment to get to kind of hang out in for an extended period of time. And so um, I'd say that farm on Reunion Island is definitely close. All right. Wow. I uh, I've never been so that's uh, yeah and I assume most people have not so that's quite a experience to have. Uh, all right, last question: If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? Gosh, um, well, it's just sort of a million things rather than one thing. But uh, with this, you know, election on the horizon. Um, 
and with a lot of the problems that I write about in, in my book, you know, you, you keep coming back to the sort of distorting power of money. And um, I don't know what the mechanism would be, but, you know, somehow reducing the influence of money in our sort of systems of politics, which is really kind of how we get along as such a large number of people on this planet, um, is, is I think, a, at least a necessary step to getting towards any of the sort of solutions to bigger, more existential problems down the road. So if we could make money somehow less powerful, that would be a great thing. Yep, sounds about right. Uh, I think you're you're in good company there. I asked that that question to Eileen McNamara when I interviewed her, former uh, Pulitzer winner with the Globe, and she said p- campaign finance reform. So <laughs> waving a wand, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, yeah, that's right. You can start to sound a little Pollyanna-ish when you say, you know, if only, if only, you know, we could just uh, limit the power of capitalism or whatever. But uh, it's true. I mean, so much comes back to it about the way people relate to each other. Hmm. All right. Well, on that note, the book is Go Tell the Crocodiles, Chasing Prosperity in Mozambique. Rowan Moore Garrity, it's been great talking with you. And in case uh, everyone couldn't tell, the book is fascinating and has way more stories and interviews and colorful explanations of, of everything going on there. So I really recommend it. Rowan, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. 